Turn with me, please, to the book of Revelation. We begin a series of messages this morning on this last book of the Bible, Revelation, and we'll read the first seven verses. Revelation of St. John the Divine, chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Hear the word of God. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you, and peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. May God bless the reading of his sacred word. Dear congregation, the last book of the Bible, the revelation of St. John the Divine, is often called the Apocalypse, coming from the Greek title of this book, the Apocalypse of John. The word apocalypse means to be unveiled. It means revelation. It crops up repeatedly in all forms of social media today. People commonly say today we live in apocalyptic times. There's an increasing awareness all around us, even in the world, that We're living in the last days. Fifty years ago, people in society who referred to apocalyptic times were considered weird or fanatics. But now even unbelievers, albeit usually too flippantly, speak about the end of the world. Politicians talk about rogue nations like Iran and North Korea getting nuclear capabilities, and what the consequences would be. Will they bomb Israel? Will they eventually, ultimately, bomb the United States? And will this be the breakdown of society and eventually the end of the world? These things are being talked about sometimes more in the world than in the church. Even unbelievers are using language and imagery from the Bible Scientists and politicians and world leaders are quite at home talking now about Armageddon and the end. And then when you combine that with what's going on in America today, the hatred, the bitter spirit, the anger, the politics, the concern for the future, which direction is America heading What is going to happen to our beloved nation? Even this week in the news, our president now proposing 
drastic reduction in our budget for armed forces, what impact will that have on America and by extension on the world? Will our children have the freedoms and the pleasures that, of peaceable living that we know today? What about grandchildren? Will Jesus come in the clouds before we can even have them? And perhaps you young people, sometimes you even wonder, don't you, will you, will you live long enough to get married and have children before Christ returns? What will happen to this world? What will happen to the future? We've begun a new year. We're thinking future. And there's no place better to turn than the book, the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. So this morning we want to turn to this book, and I do so, really, I, I confess, with some fear and trepidation. For two decades I've wanted to preach through this book badly. And the growing compulsion to do so drives me to it now. And the importance of the book and yet I need your prayers, congregation. Just as Reverend Van der Zwak, coming into some very difficult chapters in the book of Job. So we will, we will face difficult chapters in the book of Revelation. We need your prayers. But I also hope that as we approach this book, you will join with me and do so with a sense of awe and excitement. Because this book It's really all about worshiping Jesus Christ with awe and with joy and with excitement. And so let's turn to the first three verses, just the introductory material. You might call this the the prologue of the book or the, uh, the opening preface or the title page. The first three verses of the book of Revelation this morning. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written therein. For the time is at hand. Well, if you think of a book today, you think of a title page, you think of a preface, everything that goes into that is right here in these three verses. You have the title, the revelation of Jesus Christ. You have the contents, everything which John saw and bear record of the word of God, the things which would shortly come to pass. These are the things the book will consist of. You have the author, the Apostle John. We know it's the Apostle John because he just uses his own name, John. He doesn't describe who he is, meaning it must be the Apostle John. It must be a very well-known John since there are thousands of Johns in in that day, and we know the Apostle John was reticent to describe himself but we also have a kind of forward here. Details about the policies quoted and forces that were of help to John. John is, as it were, acknowledging these, like you do in the preface of a book. This book of Revelation comes from God through Christ, carried by an angel to John, and then delivered to the churches. And so you have really here three things, don't you, in these first three verses. You've got the contents of the book summarized. You've got the means of communication, how this book comes to John and thereby to us. And then you've got in verse three, this wonderful commendation. The book commended, blessed is he who readeth and keepeth the words of this book. So our theme this morning is introducing the book of Revelation First, it's content. Second, it's communication. And third, it's commendation. Now, when it comes to the book of Revelation, Christians today are polarized into two groups. 
On the one hand, the majority, and I suppose we're among them, most of us, almost ignore this book, except for some well-known texts. Like, behold, I stand at the door and knock in the first three chapters. Or at funerals and special occasions where we talk about the last day of judgment and the well of God's people in glory and the woe of the unsaved, we might go to the last chapters of this book. But by and large, we ignore particularly the large center of this book. It's so unfamiliar to us. It's such an unfamiliar world it presents to us, a world of many-headed monsters and dragons and creatures from other realms. And the symbolism throughout this book is so foreign to our modern way of thinking that we just read it and we say, I don't understand what it's all about. And we just kind of let it go. At the opposite extreme, there's a minority of Christians who are obsessed with this book. And they read it. They read it much more than they read any other parts of Scripture. And they find the answer to all kinds of historical and futuristic questions answered in the book of Revelation. Somehow they find Saddam Hussein in the book of Revelation a few years ago. Or they find Hitler in the book of Revelation or Stalin or whatever it may be. They're always finding specific details of what's going on today in the book of Revelation. Well, happily, there's a better way. A better way than both of these extremes. A way that's hinted at already in the title of this book. The Revelation of Jesus Christ should be the title. Now, the title we have is the Revelation of St. John the Divine. Of course, those are human words, but usually the title of a book is the opening words of the book. And this is a better title. Really, we don't have here the revelations of St. John the Divine. St. John recorded the revelation of Jesus Christ. This book is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Christ. Or, as it says in the original Greek, the apocalypse of Jesus Christ, which means revelation. You see, the word apocalypse simply means to unveil something. That's what revelation is. Revelatio in Latin means to make bare. If you roll up your sleeve, you make bare your arm. You reveal what your arm really looks like. And so what God does in the book of Revelation is he peels back the veil the unco- and he uncovers something that is hidden, something that has been secret. And that's why this book really ultimately shouldn't frighten us. It shouldn't be a closed book to us or even an obscure book to us Because it's meant to be a revelation. It's not meant to obscure things, but to reveal things. It's meant to be understandable. And so, too often we're we're scared, as it were, of this book because we haven't really studied it appropriately and maybe we do need some help in understanding it. We're, We're so confused and frightened by its imagery and its symbolism and the countless interpretations of this book that we forget. It is simply this, the revelation, the apocalypse of Jesus Christ, and therefore it is meant to be understood. Now, that being said, I'm not going to deny that there are many unusual things in this book. And we need to approach this book differently than we approach many other Bible books. This is apocalyptic genre. That is, the book is written in a particular vein, a particular way. It's got a particular culture about it, if you will. Um, think, think of it this way. When you go to another country, Mr. Vanderstel going to Malawi this week, there are different customs in that country. 
And often when we go to foreign countries, there are different languages. And you try to adapt, don't you? Um, when you go to certain cultures, you, you, you understand that they do things differently than you. Uh, some cultures, uh, it would be very rude to just shake a person's hand with one hand. You naturally have to do it with two and hold one hand here. Otherwise, you're insulting the person. Well, you, you, have to, you have to learn things about the culture. Well, so it is when you approach a book like Revelation, you have to learn what apocalyptic literature is like and how you have to respond to it differently than you would respond to other literature. If you approach Revelation and you take every number in this book very literally, you're certainly not understanding the genre of how this book is written. So the first thing you need to understand as you approach the book is precisely what we've been saying, that this is the revelation of Jesus Christ to John, and it has everything to do with Jesus Christ, not with Hitler or Napoleon or Saddam Hussein or any other personality from world history. It has something to say about world history and about various kinds of personalities, but it has directly to do with Jesus Christ and his revelations of himself. The book of Revelation, and that may disappoint some of you, but the book of Revelation is not about all kinds of specific world events as we're marching through church history or world history. But it has to do with Jesus. You see, we're not to read these events into the book, but we are to read them from the book. That is to say, we are to understand what goes on in our world according to the principles that we find in the book of Revelation, according to what is disclosed to us here about Jesus Christ and the things which must shortly come to pass. And ultimately, you see, it is all about him. He's the hero of the drama of this book. So let me put it this way. The Bible, including Revelation, is not written to satisfy the horoscope tendencies of our human mind. We want to know the future. We want some kind of horoscope in it, deep down, don't we, where we, we know what's going to happen. We think, wow, now we've got it here, right here in the book of Revelation. But the book of Revelation isn't designed to satisfy that curiosity. The book of Revelation is to be understood spiritually and practically, not superstitiously and speculatively. And it's to be understood in terms of the Lord Jesus Christ who sits upon the throne and who is victorious and his victory runs through all this book, his victory over all the powers of evil. And so to read Revelation as a horoscope is not only erroneous but downright sinful because it's in total opposition to everything that Jesus says in this book and in Scripture as a whole. For the Bible tells us God has set the times and seasons that the Father knows and we are not to know. It's not your business, said Jesus. To know exactly when the world will end. We are to live one day at a time. Take no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient to the day is the evil thereof. We're not to pry into the future. God holds the key to the future. If he trusted it to us, we would be sorry. If you could see the future of the world and if the responsibility would fall on your or my shoulders, we would fail. So what then is the book of Revelation all about? It's about the Lamb in the midst of the throne. The theme is the one revealed, Jesus, and the revealer, Jesus. 
And he has certain things to reveal to us. John says, things which must shortly come to pass. What are those things? And how are we to view them? Well, there are some people who say that the book of Revelation is to be viewed in terms of the immediate historical context, things that shortly come to pass. That means certainly in the first century. Things that revolve around the destruction of Jerusalem and the Roman persecution under Domitian. Uh, For the first time in John's day, it was a capital offense for a person to be a Christian. And the book must be understood in this context because the book has so much to do with persecution. So everything in the book deals with the possible exception of the last two chapters, these people would say, deals with John's own day, John's own generation, things that must shortly come to pass. Other people say, no, the things that shortly must come to pass refers to the whole New Testament dispensation and era to the end of the world. And really this book has everything to do with things that are out into the future. It really has everything to do with a future millennial event before the second coming of the Lord. And then there are other people saying, no, the things that must shortly come to pass, yes, they have to do with all of church history, but it's not just the future things nor just the past things, but really the book of Revelation is a progressive marching through church history. So we've got 2,000 years and more till Jesus comes again of history in the book of Revelation. And so you see, there are many different interpretations to the book of Revelation. Now, what I want to do for just a few minutes is I want to set those interpretations out before you. I've just mentioned in very general ways and give you the technical term for each of them. And that will get a little bit heavy, but I'll make it as simple as I can. But it's important to have the foundation, you see, to understand these different views as we approach the book of Revelation. That's why this sermon is an introductory one. Now, there are five views today of Revelation. Let me give them to you. The first is what's called a preterist view, P-R-E-T-E-R-I-S-T, preterist approach. That's the approach, as I just said, that understands the book wholly in terms of the circumstances of John's own day. Now, there are different preterist schools of theologians. Some say the book was complete. Everything written in the book of John, except Revelation 21, 22, everything was done by John's death. Others say, no, it spills over for a century or two, perhaps, uh, even three or four, some say, And it's done with the destruction of the Roman Empire in the 5th century. But they all agree to this. The word preter, by the way, means, it's a Latin word meaning past. They all agree that this book is confined to the past rather than a projection of the future. And so... The Predest approach would look at Revelation 2 and 3, the messages to the seven churches of Asia, and say these are the seven churches in John's own day, actual first century churches to whom the letters were addressed. And so the entire book is like that. It applies to things that happen in John's own day. Now, the strength of this approach is that it gives you a very clear interpretation of the overarching theme of the book, Things which must shortly come to pass. Yes, they shortly came to pass within a generation or two. The weakness of this book is if that is all the book of Revelation is, then it has very little to say to today's church in the midst of all its struggles. That's the first interpretation, preterist. The second is the historicist approach, coming from the word history historicist approach. This was the approach that most of the reformers believed, and they believed that Revelation 
was a visionary symbolization of the whole panorama of church history being unfolded to us from John's day and generations, Revelation 2 and 3, first century churches, straight through, marching through church history until you get to the end of the world. And then the day of judgment and glory and hell in the closing chapters. And so a historicist would say that these seven churches of Asia do not refer, first of all, to seven churches uh, literally in Asia only, but to seven ages of the church. And that today, we are now living in the last church era, the church of Laodicea, and we are the lukewarm church at the end of the world. So, the Reformers tended to view Revelation as like a chart of world history, a series of historical pictures moving from Christ's first coming to the end of the present age. So, for example, by the time you reach Revelation 13, they would say, the beast arising from the sea is identified with the rise of Islam. And when you reach Revelation 17, you're a few more centuries further in church history, and Revelation 17, therefore, is identified with the Roman Catholic Church and, and the papacy. Now, the strength of this approach is that it's a, a beautiful sweep of, of, of church history, but its weakness is that it assumes too easily that the book of Revelation prophesies a linear development throughout church history rather than a cyclical repetition of events from different angles of vision. That's a historicist approach. Third, there is what's called the futurist approach, the futurist approach. And that's the approach that was most popular at the beginning of the last century with evangelicals, especially dispensational evangelicals who tend to divide all of world history back from the beginning in different sections, different dispensations. But this view has actually lost ground in the last few few decades. The futurist view holds that all the visions, starting in chapter 4 through chapter 22, all of them lie in the future. There are events that will transpire immediately prior to and accompany Christ's second coming at the end of history, which will then usher in the millennial age, and Christ will be on the earth for then a thousand years or so. Now, most of these futurists, therefore, are what we call pre-millennialists. Millennium meaning a thousand years, and the idea that Christ will be here for a thousand years, and pre meaning that Christ will um, come and reign for a thousand years pre, before the final judgment. Now, the problem with this futurist approach is that not only does it detract too much from John's own day, allowing almost no comfort for the first century persecuted church in its dire, dire situation, but it also doesn't provide a lot of direction and comfort for the church as it moves along in in church history. It's always forever looking at the second coming. you meet these people all the time, don't you, uh, in the social media. They're always talking about Revelation 20 in particular. Always talking about the rapture and things of that nature. And there's a problem there of be- becoming fixated only on future things. Now, the strength of this view is that it does underscore the ultimate victory of Christ. Christ and his elect over all enemies at his second coming, which is, which is a, the major theme of this book. So that, that's the futurist view. And fourthly, there is what's called the idealist approach. The idealist approach. This approach says, Revelation is relevant for everyone since it deals primarily with principles and symbols that are always valid in all ages 
for our own personal histories and our own personal experience and the experience of the church as a whole. So the idealist view doesn't wrestle very much with this opening phrase that we're expounding now, things which must shortly come to pass, which is the operative framework for the whole book. It simply says, that's no problem. We've always been living in the last days. Ever since Christ rose from the dead and sent the Spirit to the end of the world, all of this is things which must shortly come to pass. For God, a thousand years is as one day. This 2,000 year period is, is nothing in the mind of God. So the symbolism of Revelation is to be understood, if you will, practically, poetically almost, to give comfort and encouragement to persecuted Christians of all ages. Now, the strength of this approach, of course, is that it makes the book extremely practical and valuable for the church of all ages. If this view has a weakness, it might be the weakness that some people might think that this things that are shortly come to pass is being, is being stretched a bit here or, or, or perhaps being ignored a bit. And finally, there is what we might call the eclectic approach. Eclectic, E-C-L-E-C-T-I-C. And what that word simply means is if you, if you take an eclectic approach to something, you, you, you glean a little bit from here, you glean a little bit from there, and you put together a new package. And an eclectic approach embraces the strengths, the apparent strengths, and rejects the apparent weaknesses of the four approaches I just mentioned. Now, most Reformed theologians take the eclectic approach to, some, to, to one degree or another. In fact, most Reformed theologians take the eclectic approach with a kind of an, the heaviest accent on the idealist approach. That is, that this book is applicable to the church of all ages. And that's the approach that I'll be using as well. I believe that's the safest and the most defensible exegetically. So an eclectic approach, taking the strengths of these different views and then seeing them as applicable to, the whole book as applicable to every age of the church. Now that necessarily involves us in understanding the book of Revelation not just something linear that marches through church history once, but it means that what the book of Revelation does is actually cyclical. It keeps going through church history. It keeps presenting us with parallel presentations. In fact, as William Hendrickson has pointed out, by the way, that's a wonderful book if you want to get a good basic book on Revelation, More Than Conquerors. Reverend William Hendrickson points out there are seven parallel sections in the book of Revelation. And what is actually going on in the book of Revelation is that Jesus is coming to John with seven different angles on the same vision. It's one revelation, the revelation, but it's taken from different angles. Let me let me explain. And we went out to Mount Rushmore as a family. And we saw those four figures sketched in stone. Well, we took a picture of it from the front. And then we went, we we're going down a side road, and we could just see one of the heads sticking out. I think it was George Washington. We took a picture of that. The other side road, we could see two, but not the other two. We took a picture of that. And there was one other place where we got a different view on it. We had four very different views of the very same figureheads at Mount Rushmore. Now, that's the kind of thing that's going on in the Revelation of John. There's seven sections in this book. And we get parallel cyclical views in each section of church history, of present applications for 
how to handle persecution, how to trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, how to find hope in him, and also how to be warned if we are not in him. You'll find these same things repeated again and again. Section 1 is chapters 1 through 3. Section 2 is chapters 4 through 7. Section 3, 8 through 11. Section 4, 12 through 14. Section 5, 15 through 16. Section 6, 17 through 19. And then section 7, which is a very special section, of course, that ends uh, more specifically than the others in glory, 20 through 22. So, let me summarize this then. What is Revelation all about? It's got, well, three basic themes that come together. Christ's revelations of his glorious victory now and forever over all evil. That's the overarching theme. Second theme, therefore there's hope for believers in the midst of persecution. Persecution first century, persecution 21st century, persecution to the end of the world. And third, warning for unbelievers who are fast approaching the day of judgment. Now, once you understand these major themes and you understand the framework of the book of Revelation, the proper response is not to sit at a table and ponder over it and try to put it together like all jigsaw pieces of puzzle and and, and say, now now what does that number mean there? And what does that number mean there? And and, and, and is it it 1,000? Is it really sevenfold? Is it, you know, no. You're not solving in apocalyptic literature. The goal isn't to solve a difficult puzzle. The goal here in the book of Revelation is to see the victory and the glory of Jesus Christ and to fall at his feet like John did in Revelation 1 verse 17 as we'll see in a few weeks and to crown him Lord of all. If our reading and preaching of the book of Revelation does not lead us to fall at the feet of Jesus Christ in wonder and amazement and joy at his glory and victory and give us hope in the midst of a hopeless world, we have missed the whole point of this book. This book is designed to get us to worship the King of Kings. Now, these opening verses of Revelation also teach us how beautifully this book is communicated to us. Listen again to the text. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, unto Jesus, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel. So you've got God bringing it through Christ to the angel unto his servant John. John, bringing it to us, who bear record of the word of God, of the testimony of Jesus Christ, and of all things that he saw. The word saw there is very important. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. So this text tells us really, Four things about the communication of this book as it comes to us. And that too is to impact our interpretation of it. The first thing is this. It is a personal letter. It's a personal letter. It comes from hand to hand. From God to Jesus to angel to John to us. It's like a registered delivery letter. When you have something very important, you send it by registered mail. You want to make sure that the next, the person it's designed for gets it. Well, God makes sure that we get this letter by including it as the last book of his sacred canon. It comes to us as a personal letter. It ends in the same way many of the other letters 
end in the New Testament. Look at the last verse of the Bible. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. We don't often think of John, John's book of Revelation, as a letter. We speak of the epistles of John, the letters of John, and we think of 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. But this too is a letter, a letter written to the churches in Asia Minor in the first century in the first place, but also a letter written to us today. Secondly, it's communicated to us, as we've already seen, as a revealed apocalypse. That is to say, it belongs to this apocalyptic literature, and therefore it must not be taken literally throughout let me just add here to what I've already said, that really what this book is, is a picture book of the glory of Jesus Christ. Not a book of puzzles to figure out. And so in John's revelation, the approach that we use to reading most other Bible books, a very literal approach, we pick up Genesis, we read Genesis 1, we say, Day means day, 24-hour day. Everything is literal. We have no indication that it's literature that's to be taken anything but literally. Adam and Eve are literal people, we say. But when it comes to revelation, and we recognize this as apocalyptic literature that comes through vision, it's almost reversed. Almost nothing is literal. It's symbolical. It's, It's like... You read Pilgrim's Progress very differently than you read Calvin's Institutes, don't you? Because Pilgrim's Progress is an allegory. So you read it allegorically. Well, Revelation, you're to read, not arithmetically. Seven means exactly seven, a thousand means exactly seven. No, the numbers are symbols of things. The colors are symbols of things. The patterns are symbols of things. The sevenfold patterns are symbols of things. In this book, animals have a great deal of power because they symbolize things. And all these symbols, we will see this as we go through the book, all these symbols lead to the major three themes, the glory of God the comfort of God's people, and the rejection of the unbeliever. Thirdly, this book is communicated to us as a divine vision. Notice our text says, what John saw. What John saw. Usually the scripture speaks of the word of God. It speaks of hearing, not so much of seeing. But this book is different, you see. God just doesn't speak this book to John. God shows this book to John. He shows his servants the things that must soon come to pass. Repeatedly in this book, you will hear John say, and I saw, and I saw. The rest of the word of God, or at least most of it, you hear, hear the word of God, or God said to me, or the Lord spoke to me. So in Revelation, again, the idea is not to dissect every word, but in Revelation, as we study it, what we need is we need faith to see the Word of God. Not so much as a piece of history written in advance, as an, but as an art lesson in the God-given symbols of the glory of His Son. That's what John is taking us to the picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's saying, I saw this about our Savior, and I saw that about our Savior. And as he moves to the picture, he builds us up until we come to the very end of the book and we see the future revealed to us in the great day and how Jesus will will be in control of everything in heaven and earth and hell. And all things will culminate in him. And finally, This book is communicated to us as a spoken prophecy. It's not only a divine vision, a revealed apocalypse, a personal letter, but a spoken prophecy. John says in verse 3, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that heareth the words of this prophecy. Now we still think, too often, don't we, that when you think of a prophecy, 
You think of only things future, speaking about the future. But actually, the prophet in the Bible was speaking most of the time about the present, bringing the Word of God into the present. There may be a teaching about the future, and there is in this book, but by and large, you see, the book of Revelation is to help us in our present day, our present situation. So this is the fourfold way that this book is communicated to us. And we need to keep these things in mind as we go through this book so we don't get into wrong ways of interpreting the book. And then our text ends with this wonderful commendation in verse 3. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. So, at the end of this wonderful prologue to this book, what John is doing is he's saying, just like many books do at the end of a preface, I want to commend this book to you. Actually, it's Jesus saying, I want to commend this book to you through the pen of John. Jesus is saying... I'm going to give you a commendation of this book that lures you into this book because you will get blessed by reading this book. And so this is a very important book to read. If you knew for sure you were going to get blessed by reading a book of, of, of what, 25 pages, you would read it, wouldn't you? I would hope you would. And so Jesus comes and says, blessed is he that readeth this book. He commends his own book, through John to us, which is now the last book of the Bible. Actually, in commending this book, Jesus tells us to do four things with this book, and this will serve as my conclusion to the sermon as well this morning. There are four things we must do in relationship to this book. Number one, be reading about Christ. If this book is all about Christ, and John says, blessed is he that readeth, and he's speaking about reading this Christ-centered book of Revelation, then we must know from this that blessing accrues to us from the simple, prayerful reading of the Word of God from the pulpit and hearing it preached, or the prayerful reading of the Word of God and of Christ-centered literature while we're sitting in our homes. And therefore, as we move through this book, Please, please keep your Bible open under the sermon. Read the scriptures with me as we look at verse by verse again and again throughout the sermon. And let the word of God read penetrate your mind and soul deeply because that is one way to blessing by the grace of the Spirit. Blessed is he that readeth this book. That's a good commendation for the book. Second, be obedient to Christ. Notice what verse 3 says. It doesn't say only blessed is he who reads the book, but blessed is he who reads and keeps those things written therein. So God's blessing doesn't just come automatically when you read the book. But God's blessing is accompanied with those who keep the things written in the book. And what does that mean? How do, how do we keep the things written? Well, we keep the words of this prophecy by believing them so that they influence our life in such a way that we are actively, by faith, looking forward to the coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and living out of Him here and now. That's how we keep the words of this book knowing that this world shall pass away, living in the light of eternity, looking forward to a city which has foundation, whose builder and maker is God. So really, blessing accrues to the people of God when they walk in obedience to the word of God. And in this particular book, of course, the Christ is revealed to us, yes, somewhat as prophet, and yes, somewhat as priest, but especially as king, especially as king. Now, there are other books where he's particularly revealed as a prophet, like Matthew, for example, that stresses, uh, he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes, and says, take heed, therefore, how you hear, and so on. And, and other books, uh, 
That particularly stresses priestly office like Hebrews or, or parts of Romans. We to make our bodies a living sacrifice. You're to obey him as a priest, you see. But in this book, we're to do like Psalm 2 says. We're to kiss the Son in all his glory, in sweet submission, lest he be angry and we perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. The book of Revelation is a call to keep obedience, to keep submission to Jesus Christ as the royal king of kings. And then to go out and be prophets and priests and kings under his banner to this perishing world. And thirdly, in this commendation, we are called not only to be reading about Christ and to be obedient to Christ, but also to be prepared for Christ. Notice how the the verse concludes, for the time is at hand. The time is at hand. He can come. He will come. But he can come any day now. Be prepared to meet your king in righteousness and peace at all times. That's the point of Revelation. Revelation is a panorama of what Jesus said earlier. Watch and be ready. Revelation warns us in love that we ignore the lordship and kingship of Christ at our own peril. If you follow culture, this book would tell us, or you follow Pharisees or Libertines or Nicolaitans or Jezebels, uh, if you follow these things in the first century, you will perish. And today we have our own set of things. If you follow popularity, if you follow the money trail, if you follow the the worldly view of humanism and materialism, if you follow worldly sensuality, if you follow the desires of your flesh, if you follow self-idolatry, whatever you follow today apart from Jesus Christ, you will perish. message of the book of Revelation is bow before the Lord Christ, believe in the Lord Christ, worship the Lord Christ, be submissive to the Lord Christ, be prepared for the Lord Christ to come on the clouds. And finally, fourthly, be an overcomer. Be an overcomer through Christ. The implication of verse 3, and that will become explicit as we move through the book, is on overcoming grace. Despite severe persecution, blessed is he that overcomes. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. You see, this book is meant to be a style guide, a manual guide, a handbook, whatever you want to call it, to help the believer overcome. Overcome the world, overcome his own flesh, yes, but overcome persecution from all sides. And so it exalts the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, live out of him. View everything through him. He's in charge. He's the Lord of glory. The media's approach to world history, to church history, to American history, it's all distorted because they don't see Christ on the throne. You live with Christ on the throne, and you live by faith, worshiping Him and serving Him and following Him and adoring Him and be centered on Him, and you too can be an overcomer. And you will eat of the tree of life in the midst of the paradise of God. Are you reading about Christ? Are you obedient to Christ? Are you prepared for Christ? Are you an overcomer through Christ? These are questions that will come back to us through this series of sermons. God helping us. But let me close by just giving you this this warning. I need to do this before I close. There's a reverse to the blessed of verse 3. The implication is clear, isn't it? The reverse implication is, cursed is he that reads this book and hears the words of this prophecy and does not keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. 
My earnest prayer, congregation, for every one of you is that the curse of revelation will not come upon you. But as we preach this book, that this warning of danger may be what one more means to help you understand you don't trivialize this book, you don't tamper with this book. At the very end of this book, God says that he who adds to it or subtracts from it, you shall be destroyed. And what about you right now? Are you, are you perhaps adding to the Word of God? Are you a legalist and adding more things to the Word of God? Do's and don'ts, perhaps? Or are you subtracting from the Word of God, not bowing before the King of Kings, not truly living the Scriptures? See, if you've not found your blessing in Christ... You're ignoring Christ at your peril. The curse is upon you now, and the curse will be upon you forever if you don't repent of your sins and take refuge in this glorious Lord and Savior. But if, on the other hand, you found authentic blessing in the hero of revelation in Jesus Christ, you're crucified in your exalted, victorious Lord, then you are blessed indeed. And so I want to heartily commend to you the book of Revelation that we may go forward and that you may experience blessed is he that readeth and keepeth the words written in this book for the time is at hand. Amen.